We want people outside of just fishery science. We want people who are in uh, adjacent fields, distant fields, but have maybe have a different perspective on, on what's driving this and a different theory and come put, put your theory to the test. But if you've got a sincere interest and are willing to put some energy into coming up with some uh, mechanisms that you think are driving salmon survival, all the power to you. I, I remember Darwin was an amateur scientist. Welcome back to DAM, the official podcast of Northwest Hydropower. I'm your host, Austin Rohr, and I manage all things communications here at Northwest River Partners. Salmon recovery represents a huge part of our work at the organization, but thus far, we haven't really been able to track down anyone to discuss the topic for DAM. That's all about to change because we did track down someone to discuss salmon with us. Even more exciting, that same someone is passionate about conservation and finding ways to learn more about all sorts of fish. That someone is Sean Simmons, the founder and president of Anglers Atlas, which offers a variety of opportunities for the angling community to get involved in citizen science to help fish. And, as you'll learn, he's working on a new idea to help salmon in particular. Sean, thanks so much for joining me today, and uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation and really glad that we were able to set a time aside to, uh, to make this possible. Uh, I think the first thing that, you know, I want to cover, because typically, you know, we'd open the podcast about maybe, you know, what you do, but uh, we kind of know what you do, right, being the founder and president of Angler's Atlas, so... Maybe instead you can kind of give me a, a really good rundown of just what exactly Angler's Atlas is. Sure. Well, it has evolved over time. It started just after I graduated from university up here in Prince George, British Columbia at the University of Northern BC. I uh, did a, a master's degree in what's called limnology, which is the study of lakes. And I, when I was uh, doing all my research, I realized all this great data was out there. So detailed bathymetric maps, stocking data, things that if you like fishing is a gold mine. So after I graduated, I started publishing free fishing maps, uh, writing articles and stories about uh, lakes and rivers and some ocean destinations across mostly Canada at the time. And uh, and it just grew out of that. And that's the, the, the primary reason that uh, anglers like to visit Anglers Atlas is that uh, we give them lots of free data and maps. And, and if, if you're into fishing, bathymetric map, maps can be a gold mine. Definitely. I, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into more of the fishing side of things as we go on, but uh, you are absolutely right that there's a uh, tremendous wealth of information and a really great resource to be able to access those. As far as kind of where this all started, you know, you mentioned a little bit of the, the start coming out of, you know, college and, and what you studied there, but uh, was there something in particular that kind of inspired your your passion to pursue this? Well, I always had a little bit of a background in in publishing. Uh, worked for some university newspapers and and uh, got familiar with the the process of publishing. And that was just as the internet was coming online. So this was late '90s, and I thought, why don't I try and merge the idea of publishing with this new online world? And back then, it was just very basic websites. So we start we I started publishing fishing maps and putting them online. We also published magazines as well. Uh, for, for a while, they were quite popular, but uh, magazines aren't nearly as popular anymore. And so we're strictly online. It, maybe an occasional publication we'll do just uh, for a special event or something, but for the most part, strictly online at this stage. So that's sort of where, where it started was uh, uh, the idea that we could publish this data and put it out to anglers. And then we could sell advertising and sponsorships to really uh, create a revenue stream so that we could sustain this over time. And then from Prince George, I think we started with 15 maps and then basically scaled it up to where we now well have well over a quarter million uh, water bodies cataloged across Canada and into the U.S. And we get about a million anglers visiting the, the site each year for the maps. So that was that was the origin, but it's shifted significantly since then. And uh I'll, I'll hold off uh, giving any specific details on that until later. No, that sounds great. I, uh, I am curious just real quickly, you know, um, the, it seems like maybe the almost kind of the way that technology has evolved, that the, the mapping 
has also evolved. Have you seen that um, kind of in that side of things where maybe, you know, before a map might be a specific to an area, whereas now, you know, a lot of the, a lot of kind of the different maps that are available, um, you know, you can, in theory, zoom out and look at the world, right? <laughs> Totally. Yeah. So, so, and that's a really good point because originally the maps were paper and the way it started was we just had scanned PDFs of these maps that some would date back to the 1940s where people were out surveying water bodies and doing depth, the, the, the bathymetric maps that showed you the underwater structure are the real, the real sweet maps that uh, anglers really enjoy. And so we just start publishing those. And then uh, we did do some very preliminary uh, you know, interactive maps, but it was really crude up until the point Google Maps. And I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think I'm gonna uh, mess up the date, but it was around 2006. Google Maps came out and allowed you to start plugging in their maps and overlaying data, and that's where we were able to start taking the the bathymetric maps and complementing it with other types of data that we'd be able to find. And one other question for you too, um, you know, when you look at a map, you might look at a, a road map, a satellite map, or, you know, some people would look at, uh, say, a topographic map. Um, what is a bathymetric map exactly? Yeah, so a bathymetric map is kind of the inverse of a topographic map. What it does is shows you the underwater structure so you can see where it's shallow, where it's deep, where the drop-offs are, which is really key. And it gives you a sense of where you might want to plan your fishing because, you know, the fish aren't going to be everywhere. They're going to be in very specific locations, usually along drop-offs, uh, weed beds. And so you can start to, when you when you look at a bathymetric map, you can then scope out, especially if you're coming to a lake for the first time, you can scope out where you want to go fishing and where you want to try your luck. Yeah, I think the uh, the old fishing saying goes uh, something like, you know, 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water, right? <laughs> totally. And uh, and speaking of fishing, so I know, you know, um, the the scientific side of things, there's, there's no question of the merits there, but... Uh, as far as kind of your your background on that side, I mean, are you an angler yourself? I am, but I would never claim to be a great one. So I can fish, I can catch fish, but I've spent enough time with anglers of all different shapes and sizes to know the really good ones and to know I'm not one of them. So that's kind of my position. I like to fish, but the, the folks that go out and spend 50 days a year, 100 days a year more on, on water bodies, they're the ones who are typically really dialed in and they... They live, breathe, eat fishing, and it's just it, it's uh, it's almost like they develop a sixth sense for it. So I put myself right in the middle of the category. I like fishing, but uh, but I'm not that guy. Yeah, I totally hear you there. <laughs> I uh, I'm I'm kind of in the same boat. You know, it's uh, it's something that's real fun to do. But uh, as far as having the the time and energy to commit to being that diehard about it, you know, there's just, <laughs> there's just too many other things going on, right? Yeah, yeah, and and the nice thing is I can fish kind of vicariously through these folks, and also also uh, they'll off, often take me out fishing, which is which is the best because uh, then you can go out fishing with the best and not have to uh, spend all the time getting to be the best. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, you know, from what I understand, the My Catch app is this thing that is being offered by Anglers Atlas, uh, kind of. Take me through maybe what the purpose of that app is and, and what it's intended for, as opposed to, you know, just the Angler's Atlas service or the site. I think it's important to know the, the evolution, like how it came to be. So, so we've been publishing maps on, online for, for years and, and we'd engage our audience. Uh, we'd have photo contests. Uh, when we used to publish magazines, we'd put the best photo of a, your hero shot of a nice big fish uh, on the cover of our magazines. And so we get anglers to contribute hero shots. And we found they also contribute other data. They'd often sort of tell you where you could get access points or if there's a warning. Uh, every once in a while, they'll share a secret spot, but those are very, we're, we're very careful about the secret spot stuff. And, um, and we realized, well, there's an army of anglers out there. Many of them are passionate conservationists not all, but but some of them re are really deeply connected to to the to the uh, the fishery, the resource, and uh, and and want to contribute in some meaningful way. And not to mention, some of them I find are better field biologists than some of the biologists I know because they're on the water all the time. So so the idea was, is there a way to bring together these two worlds of basically providing 
information to anglers and then having those anglers provide information back for the science in and there's several challenges associated with that you have to create systematic ways of doing that you have to be able to validate the data you have to be able to cross reference so so that it can be usable in a scientific or a management framework and so that was really the idea of my catch really testing the question can we even utilize anglers to answer that question. And so that launched in 2018. And the, really the first question we were after at that time was, can we reproduce creel surveys? So for those who don't know, creel surveys are one of the standard methods that are used in fishery science to assess angling pressure. And uh, essentially what it is, is you go, uh, and many anglers have seen this already, they'll go, they'll uh, encounter a conservation officer or a, probably not a CO, uh, but a, a, a DNR or, or some folks that uh, work or associated with, with the various agencies. And they'll ask you questions about, you know, uh, were you out fishing on this lake? How long were you out there? What did you catch? That sort of stuff. And that's used to develop an assessment of, of the fishery. It's one of the tools that, that uh, fisheries biologists use. So our first test was, can we replicate that? And so it was basically uh, four simple things. Where did I fish? When did I fish? How long did I fish? Did I catch anything, including zeros? And so that was what the first test of my catch was, just an angler reporting tool, like an angler logbook, where we could collect that information from our anglers. And then the next challenge was to see, okay, how good's the data? I mean, we don't have any quality uh, controls on that uh, on that first version. We just wanted to see our anglers uh, generally reporting uh, good information. And, and we actually uh, published a paper in the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences in 20, it came out in 2021, but it was for the 2018 year. And it was for the province of Alberta. And it turns out, it's actually fairly good in terms of representativeness, we were capturing a representative sample of the angling population. And we were able to get very good comparisons with ongoing creels that were happening that year on two rivers in Alberta. One's the Bow River and the other was the Old Man Livingston River. The, the netting survey data was a little bit off. I mean, walleye aligned, but Northern Pike was way out, which does beg the question, who's closer to the truth? But, uh, but that was really the first real test of my catch. Can we even get data that's representative of what's uh, a gold standard creel survey would look like? And so fortunately, it all came together quite nicely and, and we were able to get really, really good information. Now, things did evolve quite a bit from that, but I'll, I'll put it back to you, Austin, and, and uh, I'll let you pick up the questions from there. Well, you know, one thing I, I'd like to kind of touch on too is, you know, as you mentioned, in some cases, you know, you could argue that the people who are going to a, a body of water on a regular basis and fishing there have you know perhaps as good as uh, as good of a knowledge of it as as anyone and um, I, I think you know the point could even be made that you can have somebody who's say a, a guide on a particular river or a body of water and they're going to know that like the back of their hand but you know you can take them five miles in another direction and drop them off on a different body of water and they're almost not going to have a clue of, of how to approach it I mean you know they have obviously the knowledge to you know, read and understand things and, and the skills to probably figure it out. But uh, as far as knowing, knowing the, you know, the particularities of, say, the temperature changes in the water or, you know, where the certain spots are that fish like to congregate and hang out or whatever it is. I mean, um, you know, that's just the sort of stuff that you can almost only gain from spending an enormous amount of time in that particular space and, and you know, really trying to learn it and understand it. With that being said, um, you know, as someone who fishes and, you know, yourself as well, um, I think that we kind of understand this, but uh, a question that might come up that uh, I think I have to ask is, you know, some people might wonder how fishing can actually be useful to conservation. What, what might you say to someone who's kind of struggling with that a bit? <laughs> with that, yeah. Well, that's a, it's a really good question. Like, how are we useful? And, and I think that the best way to illustrate that is through the, the research projects that, that we have undertaken. So the first one I mentioned was the, the creel surveys. So creel surveys is an existing method that's already used in fishery science. So can we get similar data using a mobile app where anglers self-report that provides uh, data that's of similar quality? And the answer was yes. 
So right there is your first example is, yes, we were able to replicate the traditional Creel surveys. And just to put this into context, Creel surveys are typically not cheap because you've got to get a team. You've got to get uh, build what's called the stratified sample, which means you've got to tell the team how often they have to go out to these boat launches and these uh, intercept points, maybe on the water themselves. And some Creel surveys, like uh, the one in Alberta, was over $200,000 to run for a single season. Now, that was an extensive one, and they had a lot of people there. But that's very expensive. So the idea here is, well, this is a way that it's still not, it's not free because you have to have the 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 tools and the and the development associated with it and you still have to manage data but it's a significant saving so in that respect that's uh that's one of the advantages and not that we're replacing creels but we can complement creels so whereas a creel might be able to do let's say three water bodies but miss 300 because it's simply not possible this approach can survey all 300 or a larger set of those anyways and then be able to compare with the Creel survey, calibrate the model, and then you've got 10, 20, 30 times more data assessing the the, uh, the fishery. So you get a much higher resolution. And so that's just one example of how that works. But I think it's also worthwhile sort of sharing where we're doing it in other places because there's all sorts of different applications. But maybe I'll hold off on that because there was an important change that happened with the app when COVID hit that allowed us to start collecting uh, all sorts of different fisheries uh, or data for a whole series of different types of fisheries research, both on the, the scientific side with, with universities, as well as with management agencies as well, trying to help uh, support uh, fisheries management as well. And, and uh, maybe you could touch on that, you know, what kind of, uh, what was that shift during COVID? Yeah, so I don't know if it was the same uh, where, where you're at, uh, Austin, but certainly up here, when COVID hit, all in-person events were canceled. And this was pretty, I think every single province across Canada was like that. However, fishing was encouraged because you could do it isolated or in, in small contained groups in your bubbles, I think is what they called it. And so we thought, well, we had an app that already collected basic fisheries information. Two of our staff are hardcore tournament anglers and all their tournaments were canceled. And we thought, well, what if we start running catch photo release tournaments? So basically run a tournament on the app. Instead of using weight, we use length. So you measure it on a measuring device. And with the added bonus that you can release that fish immediately after you measure it. And so once you do it a few times, you can usually get the fish back in the water in under a minute. And so that allows the fish to basically uh, be immediately released where it was caught. So you don't have holding... Uh, any holding wells or or, uh, or or harvest taking place, and so it's a strong conservation message, and it allows people to compete for for cash and prizes, and it gives us an amazing new experimental tool uh, for us in terms of we uh, structuring a whole different a whole world of uh, different types of fisheries research and management projects, and that uh, that really opened the door to a wide range of different uh, research and management uh, activities that we can undertake simply by engaging anglers to compete in an event. Now, I should caution, not everybody likes the word tournament. Sometimes uh, some some places really, you know, the, the the hair bristles on their on their on their neck when they hear the word tournament. You can call it a bio blitz. So you don't have to uh, treat it like a tournament, but essentially it's an event model. And that really provided that that key shift that allowed us to rapidly uh, ec basically implement a research project and allowed us to do it across uh, multiple uh, multiple regions. So you could be on a single water body or you could, could do it across an entire continent. You could do it over a single day. You could run it over several weeks or several months and you could run these simultaneously so that each event basically addressed a very specific research or management question. So I'm sure that's Kind of all, uh, yeah. Kind of a little confusing at first, but that's sort of the the major shift that happened for us. And and I can get into some of the details and what that looks like in terms of specific projects. Definitely, I uh, yeah, that's definitely something I'd like to to dive into with you. And you know, one of the one of the interesting things is actually, um, you know, where we're at here, the sort of the beginning of COVID, they actually like shut down fishing um, because they didn't want people coming into contact with each other, I think, outside. Um, 
you know, going out and, and congregating in those spaces. Uh, but people did did participate in it anyways. It, it kind of didn't really work, I think, as much as they wanted it to. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that uh, as someone who, you know, got into it a lot uh, during that time, especially once everything, you know, opened back up, then it was like, okay, this is a great, a great way to, to get out and do something when all the indoor activities are still shut down. I didn't see necessarily the the best example of of anglers uh, in all situations, and I think that the uh, you know one of the cool things about what you're doing is that it, it sort of does encourage people to take a more uh, conservi- conservation minded approach as opposed to um, you know doing things that maybe wouldn't be as as good for the resource. As far as the kinds of research projects and uh, examples of this, um, you know, are there are there specific ones you could point to, and and maybe also, you know, who and and kind of where the the partnerships are taking place as far as you know, maybe some of the organizations or scientists who are able to take all of this data and and use it for um, you know various purposes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess maybe before I jump into the specific examples, it's always important for me to emphasize that. Uh, through these events, uh, anglers are providing a lot of high resolution data, including latitude and longitude. And that's something we have to be very careful of because we don't want these high resolution point data to be to be uh, out there in the general public. Anglers are trusting us to to keep that data secure. And and but we're also scientists, so we want to publish data. So the balance point is, and that's that uh, seems to uh, be acceptable to most of the anglers, is that uh, the latitude and longitude stays secret, whereas the water body itself, so long as it's not a super small water body, uh, is good enough. So basically, a uh, you know a reservoir, we'd say the catches were attached to this reservoir, but we wouldn't say where exactly on that reservoir, or it was on this river, but we wouldn't say where on this river. And so that seemed to be an acceptable balance point between protecting the privacy of the anglers, which which is very important because they're providing data to us, and a lot of these uh, secret spots where they like to fish are secret spots for a reason, and uh, they don't want it uh, published. But they also recognize our goal is to publish uh, publish sci- scientific research. So generally, the water body level is is that acceptable uh, point uh, or balance point between those two. Now, in in terms of sort of what what research projects we we're doing, so I'll start with uh, well, I had a conversation with Clayton Rains this morning. He's with the U.S. Geological Survey and also a Ph.D. student at University of West Virginia, uh, and. He's looking at a condition on bass, on black bass, that is called blotchy bass syndrome. And it's actually identified as a virus. And so it looks like these ink marks on the outside of bass as well as in the mouth. And uh, they have recently identified that it is attached to a virus. However, they know very little about where it happens, how often it happens, what the seasonal variation is. So what we do is, again, this is using the event model. We set up the blotchy bass bonanza. We set it around North America. You can fish anywhere in North America. And the goal is to report all your bass. And uh, since it's in multiple jurisdictions, we couldn't really run it like a a length-based tournament. And we didn't really want uh, the longest fish here. We wanted uh, full length distributions and full uh, uh, the complete population when people are reporting. So basically they just uh, report their bass and, uh, and then every bass is added into a random draw. And so it doesn't matter if it's a blotchy bass or it's a regular bass. Uh, Every time they report a bass, it gets, uh, counts as a ballot into a draw that we'll do on, on long weekends as well as monthly. And AFTCO has been our uh, supporter of that and provided hundred dollar gift cards for AFTCO merchandise uh, that provides the incentive. And then from that, we're able to get a sense of where blotchy bass happens across uh, North America. And uh, if we were on a, on a video, I could sort of visualize this. I could show you exactly what it looks like on a state by state, including uh, provinces. And we've got them from Texas all the way to Ontario. And uh, and it also tells you how often it happens. And since this is a full year event, we'll see as it happen more in the spring, more in the summer, more in the fall. What's the frequency of this? So it gives us presence and prevalence. And so that's one 
uh, event that is tied to a very specific research objective. And, uh, and that's not uh, management connected. That's, that's still pure research uh, that we're in for that event. Um, I don't know, before I jump into any other events, you have, you have any questions on that one? Well, I, I think it does, uh, it does lead me to one kind of question. Um, although I, I think in some ways it's kind of partially answered. So, um, you know, maybe it'll kind of, kind of roll into where you're going and we can continue forward. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that comes to mind is like, you know, what sort of specific data might you be trying to, trying to collect and then, uh, you know, turn around into, uh, something. And I, I think that, you know, from the sounds of it, the, the data collection really varies by, you know, kind of the specific goal, whether it be, uh, you know, blotchy bass or whether you're trying to get kind of a good, um, you know, rough population estimate, let's say. Yeah. And it's usually tied to the, the standard reporting. So basically, if you think about the app, you basically press a button, you start a trip when you start fishing. And then when you catch a, uh, a fish, you basically add your catch, uh, you put your fish on a, on a measuring board, uh, and you take a picture. And then you basically go back fishing while well, you release the fish, go back fishing or, uh, or, or harvest it. If that's, if that's what, uh, your, your goal is. Um, and then basically at the end of the trip, you press end trip. And so there's a whole series of data that's collected from starting a trip, reporting your catch, ending, ending your trip. So we get a information such as, uh, a length of the fish, for example, how many fish you catch in that period, which allows us to calculate a catch rate. And it allows us to get uh, a visual inspection of the fish. So if, for example, when we run a tagging tournament, which we've done with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife for a small lake in, in uh, North uh, Eastern Washington, uh, we were able to I detect if it was if the fish was tagged and did a real time population estimate based on that, and that was for a demonstration event uh, just leading up to the American Fisheries Society conference uh, a couple of years ago in Spokane. Oh, that's fantastic! And you know, another thing too that I I think uh, you know I'm I'm curious about is there within these events there are various awards for participating and getting involved. Um, you know, I'm curious not only maybe what some of the incentives are that you're providing to anglers for downloading and utilizing the app, but then also too, maybe, you know, kind of what, um, what typically qualifies someone for some of those awards? Like, you know, you're not, uh, you know, for a tournament, for example, you'd be going after kind of the, the biggest fish, but I mean, in some of these cases, is it kind of like, you know, we're not, we don't care so much about, uh, if you're the person with the longest fish as much as, you know, you just by fishing, you're entered into it. Totally. And, and that's, that's the key part of this event model is that uh, you've got a specific set of objectives in terms of what your scientific or your, your management objectives are, and you plug in the incentives to incentivize that type of data. So for example, we work with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and they had uh, significant gaps in their walleye management plan in that they'd stock, I think, over 160 million walleye every year. So significant resources would go into this. But once the fish are released, it's almost like a black box. You've got a few pinpricks where you have some creel surveys, a few netting surveys, but you're really not sure what's happening across the landscape with the walleye fishery. So what we did is we set up a, a statewide event. Uh, fish anywhere across Iowa for two months, beginning of May, end of June. And we incentivized the longest fish because that's always an important part. Everyone wants bragging rights. But because we wanted full length distribution, we'd have other prizes. We, we'd have, uh, in this case, it was most fish caught, although um, a little bit. That that uh, incentive, I, I want to change around a little bit because uh, there, there are some biases there that we, we, need to, we need to address. But we also wanted to capture the zeros as well. So that was another piece of data that was important. So what we'd have is what's called a tough luck award award. So basically if you started a trip, didn't catch anything, ended that trip, so long as you were on a water body, you'd be entered into that prize. So that allowed us to capture that zero, which is often really difficult. So it was using that incentive model to really get at some of the data that was important from a fisheries management perspective. And so those incentives are really, really important. And sometimes it's it can be a small incentive. Other times it could be quite significant. I mean, for our 
kind of they're they're, they're not directly tied to a, a specific research project, but our walleye wars series that we have in Canada, that's a $250 entry fee with a $10,000 first place payout. So those are the serious anglers that are, are are out there for some serious coin and you get some phenomenal fish coming back at that that level because those are certainly among the best of the the walleye anglers uh, that participate in that of that event. Well, and I think uh, that's good, that's good to hear too. Um, you know, for example, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with the 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 instance, but uh, last year, I think it was last year, was the the big scandal with uh, the walleye tournament and people putting like weights in the fish or whatever. So, um, you know, it's good that uh, a lot of these award models aren't necessarily incentivizing people to go out and do something, um, you know, potentially detrimental to the to the resource. Let's say in the name of, you know, collecting their prize. Yeah, 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 totally. And and that is that is a challenge is that you do find people and it's rare. It's the vast majority of anglers are are honest and and uh and have have good integrity and but you find the occasional ones that are really trying to game the system. And so that's something you're always wa- watching for and you're always uh you're always guarding against and sometimes you have to adjust how how you're running these events in order to minimize that. But it's a cat and get a uh, mouse game and it's common not just to 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 digital platforms but certainly those in person platforms where somebody tries to stuff stuff uh, weights in a belly and that sort of stuff. Yeah, that stuff is uh is no good. <laughs> it certainly doesn't certainly doesn't help on the on the conservation end which I know is, you know, such an important part of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, speaking of awards, could you also tell me more about this particular, you know, um the I guess the the name of it implies an award, right? Which is this salmon prize. Ah, yes, and a very different strategy there, but it both involves competition. So, so I'll step back a little bit. So, so what we've been talking about now is working with anglers through competitions to uh, uh, basically collect data for specific research or management challenges that they face, whether it be research on blotchy bass or research on walleye or uh, a wide range of other sorts of research projects. But uh, through the work that I'm doing here, and it's called Citizen Science, This World with My Catch, I've become quite involved with the American Fisheries Society, which is the largest fisheries science organization in the world. And it's uh, a fascinating organization. I'm uh, now president-elect of the Washington, B.C. chapter, as well as president-elect of the of the uh, uh, collaborative research with stakeholders section uh, that's part of the national organization. And as I'm getting to know a lot of these other fisheries air, uh, scientists and and people that, uh, especially here in, Wa- in Washington, British Columbia, uh, realizing some of the challenges they face, and specifically around salmon and the ability to predict accurately how many salmon are returning. Uh, Austin, you probably heard uh, sometimes these these estimates are way out. Either they're way too high or they're way too low. And it seems to be getting harder and harder to predict the number of returning salmon. And my gut tells me that that's primarily because there are shifts in the ocean that are quite significant. I mean, we're seeing tuna off the west coast of Vancouver Island right now. We've never seen that uh, historically, but it's now a regular occurrence, end of August, beginning of September. And so there's shifts taking place that our models just aren't able to to, uh, accommodate. I mean, the models used to predict reasonably well, you know, in the 90s and early aughts, but uh, but it seems to be getting harder and harder to predict that. And that's because the mechanisms that are driving salmon survival are not well understood because they're shifting radically. You're getting shifting nutrient dynamics, uh, density changes in ocean currents, different upwelling, different downwelling than one, what was historical. And so there's a real uh, challenge in understanding this and also an opportunity. So thinking about a competitive model, But don't think about anglers in this case. Think about fisheries scientists. Is there a way we can utilize the power of a competitive model to answer some of these questions? What are the mechanisms driving salmon survival uh, and their their return? So the idea of the salmon prize was, again, you have to you have to win. And it's kind of like a leaderboard. But basically, you get a bunch of teams of scientists and they can be. Uh, you know, scientists in fisheries, or they can be scientists that also include, let's say, oceanographers, or let's say they specialize in remote sensing and satellite interpretation, or they specialize in machine learning, come together and say, 
I think I can best predict the returns of these salmon. And so they will enter in their predictions along with an explanation of what, why they're predicting it and, and, uh, and the models they're using. And then we will award prizes for those teams that best predict the returning salmon. And the idea here is not so much to, 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 uh, um, uh, address, you know, have a fun competition like a fishing event. The idea here, here is to see, can we get at some of the underlying mechanisms that are driving salmon survival within, and I'm thinking primarily the ocean, because our freshwater environments are fairly well monitored. We've got a pretty good sense what's going out, what's coming in. It's that ocean space that's the big black box. And so this was the idea behind the salmon prize, and it emerged out of the meeting we had last year in Bellingham uh, for the Washington, B.C. chapter of AFS. And we had a, a, a number of uh, uh, fishery scientists really keen on it. So since then, we basically put uh, an initial application together on the website. So teams can go in, they can sign up, and then they can compete for who has the best prediction of returning salmon. And the idea here is that hopefully with, with enough participation, enough diversity of competing theories, we can start to tease out some of these mechanisms that are driving salmon survival. And to your point, I think that one of the things that maybe catches people off guard when we're trying to talk about the different issues that salmon have is that ultimately, you know, we don't really know much about their ocean life cycle. I mean, we have a, a, a decent understanding for sure, but uh, sometimes when you tell people like, yeah, we don't really exactly know where this population of, of salmon from this river goes once they hit the ocean, uh, I think that kind of takes people aback a little bit. Yeah, well, you have to think about the scale as well. The ocean is a vast place with very, and it's very hard to monitor. I mean, you get pinpricks on the landscape. You, there, there are, there's certainly data coming in and there's uh, every passing day, there's more sources of data but we're just in the process of trying to trying to understand it. And since the ch there are changes taking place, like it seems almost on an annual basis, uh, figuring out what's happening is a real challenge just because it's, it's so vast and it's so hard to monitor. Similar to the challenges fisheries biologists face when we were talking about the events model, you can do a few creels surveys across the, uh, the landscape, but you can barely touch the, the water that's out there without spending huge resources. Same thing in the ocean, although I think it's probably 10 or 100 times uh, more complicated there. Yeah, and I mean, it, it totally makes sense too in the, the context of, you know, not maybe not salmon research, but in terms of ocean research. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's a, a good way to really actually put a, you know, any sort of data behind it but i think it's often said that like we have a better understanding of outer space than we do of our own oceans or something to that effect and um you know when you think about salmon as being a, a fish that spends a huge chunk of its life in the ocean it makes sense that we're you know we're only so capable of of understanding them as far as like you said i mean you know sending a <laughs> sending a boat out there um, you're only going to be able to cover so much water out of the, the vast, vast quantity of it that exists in the Pacific alone. Yeah, not to mention, what about the middle of winter? Who's out in a boat in the middle of winter? I mean, I, I say that knowing that one of our advisors, uh, uh, Dr. Richard Beamish, uh, he helped uh, charter, uh, I think it was the pro Professor Kaganovsky, an ocean research vessel, and I can't remember if it's 2018 or 2019, but they went out for 30 days in the North Pacific in the middle of winter, like talk about uh, seasickness, uh, but went out just to collect uh, some baseline data. And and uh, and they've al already started publishing uh, some of the results results of that. But that that's just a testament to how difficult it is to understand what's going on through the complete life cycle of the, of the salmon. And the goal here is to really let's pull together teams who think about things a little bit differently than we have historically, certainly rooted in fishery science, but where are the oceanographers who are monitoring what changes are taking place? Are there new technologies like uh, hyperspectral satellites, which uh, are sort of the next generation of satellite that have 
instead of just a few bands of data coming in, they literally have hundreds of bands of data. So maybe we can tease out rather than, okay, there was a bloom here. Maybe we can tease out, okay, it was this species. And here's the estimated volume and biomass of this. And we, and we can start thinking about uh, seeing that base of the food chain in much higher resolution. Maybe there's machine learning techniques that could come in. And so what we want to do, kind of like the way the X Prize does for everything else, but for, for salmon, can we find ways of having teams of scientists come up with different and competing hypotheses and see who gets closer to the truth? And seeing it, are we seeing clustering of certain types of variables or certain types of uh, uh, hypotheses that are, are more accurate than, than maybe our, our current models. And then through that, start teasing out uh, more in, information. Now, I don't think the, the competition is gonna answer it through a single event, but the way we've structured the Salmon Prize is that we're able to run multiple competitions, much like we run competitions on, on MyCatch. And the idea will be, uh, let's find some sponsors, get some prizes and see if we can incentivize Scientists who think they they might have a theory that is worth being tested, come in, compete in the arena and see if you can best predict the returning number of salmon. And and so it's a different take on how we can answer this this uh, th this perplexing challenge uh, through a competitive model. It's it's funny, you know, you you mentioned um, kind of the the bravery that it takes to go out there in the middle of the the winter and do some of this work and. I remember taking a, uh, a community college level marine biology class and the professor there, you know, he, he kind of cautioned like, Hey, if this is something you're thinking about, you know, just understand it's not always going to be glamorous. And, uh, he pointed to an example of, of some work he did where he was measuring, I think, bycatch on a fishing boat off the, off the coast here in the Northwest. And, you know, it gets uh, it gets pretty rough and and pretty ugly out there sometimes, and um, it can definitely be a, a challenge. And that that kind of also leads me to maybe something I wanted to ask you next, which is with the the salmon prize in particular, are you finding that there's a uh, maybe sort of a, a particular subset of scientists that are especially interested in this? Maybe you know whether it's uh, folks at that academic level who are studying to, um, let's say, you know, achieve a, a master's or a doctorate or, you know, go into marine biology or, you know, are there well-established scientists who are jumping on board? I mean, what kind of, uh, what kind of people is this, is this really been reaching and, and inspiring? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and it is still new. In fact, we've only just launched our first pilot test. And this is just sort of a pilot test uh, started November 1st, ends December 31st, and it's for just five runs on the Fraser River that we're testing it out. But but I'll back up a little bit. When when the idea was just first being formulated, I, I'm not a salmon scientist myself. So I built applications. I've got enough science background that I've got a pretty good sense of uh, uh, of the scientific method, but I am not a salmon scientist. So I started reaching out to as many of the esteemed salmon scientists that that uh, I knew in the Pacific Northwest. So so certainly Dick Dick Beamish is is uh, uh, core, and he's been on board since the beginning. But there are others like Carl Walters out of UBC. Uh, there's uh, Ray Hilborn, uh, University of Washington, Dan Schindler as well, uh, working with Curry Cunningham. Uh, uh, Thomas Burens, who's with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, does does a lot of modeling there as well. And so they're kind of the brain trust that uh, when when we're developing this out, I'll put ideas out and I'll hear back from them. So they help sort of craft how we'd structure this competition to be sort of most likely to achieve our, our goal. Because just predicting the number of salmon isn't necessarily getting to the to the to, to the mechanism, but if you also include, well, what's your theory behind those predictions and what's the model behind that, we can do retrospect and retrospective analyses and that sort of stuff. So it was really working with that brain trust first, making sure that this was as best positioned for success as possible. And now we've just basically launched it uh, beginning in November, this first competition. And again, it's, it's just a very uh, short-term competition and technically it's for the run that's already come in. But it's just to make sure we've got the the method down. And so what we've done is just put a very small prize in. Uh, first five teams that make a submission, and it doesn't have to be even right. I'm going to give 200 bucks for just to incentivize the teams. 
And then the second part will be just a thousand dollars for the team that uh, most accurately predicts predicts the uh, return. Now, it does get complicated because which return are you talking about? Are you talking an in season run where you get some numbers preliminary? And then there's two sets of numbers afterwards. We're focusing this specific competition on what's called the the management adjusted numbers, which is uh, basically your your run size uh, plus uh, or your spawner spawner numbers, your catch, and your management adjustment uh, after after the fish uh, actually reach their spawning ground. So, so there's a little bit of detail, probably far too much information than your audience wants to hear at this stage, but, but that's, that's what this first competition is and allows me to do a rapid cycle and test. And so we'll have the answers or have their predictions in by the end of December. I'll have those management numbers known in February, and then we'll get a sense of how it worked. And then we're basically setting it up for next year. And the, uh, the first competition I want to have next year, you'll have to predict it before the runs come in and it'll be, I'm calling it the sockeye international and it'll be for five or six major sockeye runs. So you got to predict the full Bristol Bay, Copper River, uh, maybe the Yukon, Skeena, Fraser, Columbia, those rivers and, and make a prediction on those. And that'll be basically launched in the late winter spring where we'll be uh, uh, soliciting teams and collecting uh, their predictions. I hope, I hope, you know, uh, well, maybe the, the general audience listening might uh, only, only get so far with some of that. I hope that, you know, somebody out there listening is either, uh, you know, in that science world or, or knows somebody who is that, uh, you know, can get a little bit kind of get their interest peaked and, and maybe get involved in this. Um, you know, one thing that I'm very curious about is kind of what what it was that that sparked the interest in diving real deep into the the salmon science in particular, and then also maybe um, you know what uh, what the reasoning was for starting with the Fraser River sockeye in particular. Yeah, I guess I guess there's two parts to why I took an interest in this. One is is it's a perplexing challenge. Things are changing. Our models aren't keeping up with them. There's, and maybe it starts best with this question. How is it at a time that we're seeing an epic collapse of many of the runs of salmon on the West Coast? And I'm speaking of British Columbia here because that's where I'm based. How is it we're seeing an epic collapse of salmon on the West Coast where at the same time we're experiencing an all-time record high of salmon in the North Pacific? And the fact that we don't know the answer to the quest that question is both a challenge as well as an opportunity. And so it's that perplexing challenge that captured me. And then it's also the fact that, well, we've been running competitions for a number of years now. I've got a good sense of how the competitive model works and how we may be able to use that competitive model to uh, achieve uh, outcomes or, or findings that would be otherwise very difficult. And I thought, well, I could apply that competitive model here, but instead of anglers, apply it to scientists very different audience. And so there's a lot of learning going on as we're, we're doing this. But but I, I saw there, you know, we've got enough experience in the competitive running competitions that I could see us transferring that fairly easily over. So those were sort of the two driving factors. And plus, since, since I seem to be, have immersed myself in the world of fishery science beyond just the, the angler stuff that I'm doing now through AFS, I thought, well, why not give it a shot? So uh, that's, that's the, the <laughs> hopefully that answers your question. It, it does. And I, I think, uh, you know, I know we're very excited about it and uh, it prevents it presents some really good opportunities, um, particularly, like you said, where some of these models either aren't keeping up or, you know, we're really struggling with um, with how to kind of approach some of the challenges that we're seeing. And um, and to your point, you know, uh, without getting into, I guess, some of the, the controversies that uh, we often are, are tackling down here with uh, with our salmon is, you know, when you look at just the, the coast as a whole, uh, you're definitely seeing a lot more of these sort of, you know, um, major declines in returns across the board. And, and it's really perplexing when you try and look at it on maybe a river by river basis, because, um, you know, no, no two rivers are alike, certainly. And uh, no two salmon runs are, are even really necessarily alike. And yet uh, we're kind of seeing the, the same patterns developing or, or, you know, in some cases you see these really strange outliers as well. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's definitely throws, throws you for a loop when you're trying to really understand what's actually going on. 
Yeah, yeah, certainly. And it's it's not just when when a run's lower than expected. It's also sometimes runs far higher than expected. It means we we just aren't getting a sense of 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 what are the mechanisms driving that survival, right? Like I remember, uh, I think the year uh, they launched a, a commission here in, in Canada was a year they had record high sockeye returns. And it was supposed to be a commission on why are there so record lows? So it just it it does illustrate the the challenge that 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 we are facing here. Yeah, and I think uh, I think that one of the things that uh, has come up a lot as well, and and uh, I'm curious if you've experienced the same thing in Canada, is you know you see kind of across the board, it's like well steelhead, chinook, sockeye, etc. You know, are having these kind of you know real roller coaster rides. And then for whatever reason, and I don't know, you know, it could, it could be, uh, you know, a number of things or, or a combination of factors. But uh, one thing that seems to be happening is the the pink salmon seem like they're doing great. <laughs> you know, they're they're having a great time for whatever reason. Totally. And and that's the sort of thing we, we want to see if we can get a better understanding of. Now, granted, that's the long game. Uh, right now, I'm just trying to get this this first version of the salmon prize up and running, and just make sure we're working through the kinks, making sure we can recruit enough diverse scientists out there to come up with a whole suite of different uh, competing hypotheses to test. And uh, but the goal is uh, we can be running these uh, uh, competitions. You can have multiple competitions. Sockeye is the one we chose. Uh, primarily because that seemed seemed to be uh, where where the interest was among the scientists that we were speaking to at the time. But there's certainly, you know, chum salmon, another uh, species that that is really important to First Nations on the coast here. Uh, why are we why are we seeing these these radical changes in their returns as well? So so I know there's an appetite, and really the 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 challenge that I'm working on now is and it's really there's two key challenges. We've got this application built so we can run these competitions. The, the next challenge is making sure we recruit enough uh, scientific teams to compete. And then second is making sure we can find enough sponsorship to uh, to make it worthwhile. Because again, like the fishing competitions that we were doing with anglers, you have to have some incentive in there to make it uh, palatable. People are putting their time and their energy. There's got to be a win in there somewhere. So that's where I'm spending quite a bit of my time now is, is reaching out to folks who are interested in this and want to address, and and it may not be sockeye. Maybe it's chum, or or may, maybe they want to look at pink and and the incredible returns of pink runs. Uh, can we come up with some sort of sponsorship uh, program where we get prizing uh, that will incentivize these these researchers to uh, participate and and compete? I think that that uh, that spins off two different questions, and and I'll start with this one. As far as actually reaching those salmon scientists is concerned. I mean, what kind of is the the process for trying to recruit those folks? Is it you know getting the word out, or you know, are there ways to to advertise to them, or maybe you know put the put the salmon prize kind of in front of their face where they're going to see it and maybe uh, decide to take it up? Yeah, well, that's kind of the motivation to uh, to jump on the call with you, Austin, is to help get that word out. Now, I know this may not be the the ideal audience for this the salmon scientists, but yeah, that is that is the next challenge for us to recruit uh, the scientists. We need to get in front of the scientists. So certainly, there's there's the scientists I'm already working with and tapping into their network, and that's really good for this first pilot, just to make sure we're we're we've got the system working, the methods all right, it's clear, it's intuitive for the the scientists, um, and just this is our first real learning uh, opportunity. Uh, from there, it's going to be well. Uh, can we tap into the American Fishery Society because that's certainly a, a an organization that's that's natural to recruit uh, scientists from, and uh, we're organizing actually a joint uh, conference this year with Idaho, the Idaho chapter of the American Fishery Society, with the Washington B.C. chapter of the American Fishery Society. Uh, is having their conference in Spokane, end of end of April, beginning of May, and we're going to have a series of symposia, which is basically talks on specific aspects. And so there's going to be a modeling talk on how you model, and uh, also I want to have a talk on uh, oceanography and salmon ocean ecology. What are the drivers of salmon ocean ecology, uh, where people can speak on this, and if I can figure it out. I'd also like a workshop to uh, train potential because I'm sure there's there's some folks who are probably interested in this but may not feel they're quite ready to do it. Can we offer a workshop and and uh, 
and help uh, help them sort of get up to speed on this. So I, I see if if we can get all the pieces together, and certainly funding is going to be a key part of that. So constantly knocking on doors for for sponsorship to to support this, uh, create almost an ecosystem that that attracts and pulls in fishery scientists in into this. Uh, into this new approach and new methodology for trying to understand salmon survival. And I definitely do. Uh, I want to, I want to touch on that sponsorship thing a bit more as well. But um, one, one other thing that just came to mind to me too, is, uh, you know, here at, at our organization, we've had some really great interns on who have helped us with all kinds of various things over the years. And a lot of them haven't necessarily been subject matter experts when it comes to energy or environmental issues that we deal in. Um, but they're, they are really intelligent and, and very good at putting together models. And so, you know, one, one question I have is like, you know, is this narrowly focused on um, just somebody who's a fisheries scientist in particular? Or could other people with scientific backgrounds that can put together models maybe be qualified enough that they could jump in on this as well? I'm totally for equal opportunity. I think if you think you have a theory, and even if you're not trained in, as an official fishery scientist or any of these areas, but you have a theory and you're familiar with with how 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 the modeling works, and you want to give it a shot, I think if if you're confident enough to put yourself out there and uh, and compete, uh, all the power to you. I I don't see why there's any reason not to have folks who aren't her outside. In fact, that's probably something to emphasize. Uh, quite quite a lot is we want people outside of just fishery science we want people who are in uh adjacent fields distant fields but have maybe have a different perspective on on what's driving this and a different theory and come put put your theory to the test we, we you know uh i don't think there's a, a reason we should prevent anyone from trying this right other than if you're just going to sort of randomly pick numbers and you're not going to put any thought into the the models or the methods or the or the hypotheses behind it well that doesn't interest me much but if you, you've got a sincere interest and are willing to put some energy into coming up with some uh mechanisms that you think are driving salmon survival all the power to you i i remember darwin was an amateur scientist <laughs> that is a that is a very good point and i and i i think uh you know there's definitely something to be said for for getting some outside perspective and maybe getting, you know, another set of eyes or, or whatever it be that, uh, people, people can provide some, some interesting input when they're, they're coming from a, a unique background like that. Yeah, totally. That really is a big, a big part of what we're trying to achieve here is we want people in different disciplines, ideally working together as teams so that you can bring both knowledge sets together and see if you can come up with alternative hypotheses that might explain things better. Certainly. And, and as far as kind of going back to that sponsorship side of things as well, uh, maybe you could tell me kind of who so far has, has jumped on board that's been helping out and also maybe who you're, you're hoping to reach as far as people or, or groups or organizations that would want to get behind something like this and, and help see it continue forward. Yeah, well, at this stage, it's just me putting in the money. So uh, I've I've put up uh, not much, just two grand as this initial test, because I wanna I wanna see it run through, and I wanna see you know I wanna see everyone run run the laps around the track and just see see how it all works. But I mean, the, the there are a number of uh, of organizations or, or companies that I think have a natural interest in this, and cer- certainly hydro facilities would be a natural fit. Uh, I could see um, in any fish fishing companies, uh, either commercial, or I could see uh, conservation organizations who are passionate about uh, about about their salmon having this. And, and maybe some people who are focused on just their river system. Well, we can just set up a competition for your river system and just see if somebody wants to just make a prediction on just, let's say, the uh, the uh, the Chilco run on the Fraser. Maybe that's the one that they really care about. Maybe it's a First Nations that wants to know more about this. And so I want to see this much like I'm. I, I see the the uh, the competitive events on my Catch and Anglers Atlas. We can we we can run many events simultaneously, targeting a very specific objective. I I see the same thing applied here. So so that's sort of a wide range. I, I also think uh, you know folks. Uh, 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 in the technology sector would have a natural fit. 
I mean, hyperspectral satellites, I keep coming back to that because it's what one of the things I think could really help add some new data and some new clarity. Or maybe there's somebody that's got a, an idea of, of uh, obtaining data in a, in a whole new way that'll open up uh, o- open up new discoveries and new insights into what's happened in the ocean. I know there's there's a lot of things going on. And so so basically, uh, th- there's a wide range of different types of sponsors that, that could participate. Oh, that's really exciting. And, uh, you know, one thing I'll touch on quickly is uh, I over the holiday, I, I was speaking with a, a longtime close friend who's in kind of that technology sector and is really starting to explore, I think, a new career opportunity that is tied into sort of the way that AI is able to collect data and model and things like that. And so I'm sure you know, when you think about the satellites, when you think about the, the AI developments, that there's a lot of really interesting new ways that we can we can collect data and develop these models. And um, it's it's exciting to think about for sure. I think the other thing that uh, is is worth mentioning is you you touched on the ability to sort of take this and apply it to other locations and it expand beyond just kind of the the focus right now on the Fraser. And I think that, yeah, if anyone, if anyone out there who is listening or, or who gets a hold of this podcast is interested in supporting this, um, you know, it's really good to know that they could, they could potentially jump behind it and, and bring it to maybe a, a river system or, or a population that they're particularly interested in learning more about as well. Yeah. And, and I think it can only benefit, you know, if, if you get in a competition, where where you're you're uh, bringing people together, you're having conversations, you're 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 going through the 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 steps of making predictions on returns. That in and of itself will, will bring uh, uh, sort of a, a spotlight to to that fishery in a in a I think a very unique light. And so so I think that in and of itself, just bringing people, getting them more involved with what's going on with the the fishery, is helpful. Absolutely. I, uh, you know, at some point I should probably kind of squeeze in the, the hydropower question. And, and I know you brought it up a little bit. Um, how do you see whether, whether it is the salmon prize itself or uh, whether it's also my catch and, and anglers atlas, how do you see some of these being able to intersect with hydropower and, and some of the fish mitigation stuff that goes on and, and being able to kind of, uh, you know, tie in the, the data and research with some of the projects going on there? Yeah, well, I, I have seen a couple of examples that would be a natural fit in terms of my catch. Uh, I know that that uh, there's some predator control work going on with, uh, I think, northern pike minnow, as well as uh, northern pike and uh, and some other species in the Columbia, where I think people get paid to to uh, harvest and then they have to return heads. I mean, we've actually ran, uh, ran a, a predator control. I know it's kind of contradictory to the idea of conservation, but it's for the kokanee population in a lake up here in Kootenay Lake, uh, where we're getting rainbow trout and bull trout being harvested uh, in order to relieve pressure on the kokanee so they can rebound. It's part of a much larger research project that has a, a bunch of other activities associated with it as well. But uh, but uh, we just well, we just got an email uh, this morning from uh, somebody at the Flaming Gorge uh, Reservoir wondering if uh, it could be used for predator control of some lake trout there to help their kokanee population rebound. So so in terms of predator control, I hadn't even thought about it when I launched uh, my catch, but that's turning out to be one of the one of the tools you can you can do. I know uh, we had another uh, uh, idea that we haven't haven't done yet about uh, predation so largemouth bass predation of salmonids uh how significant are largemouth bass as predators so we could run an event basically where you catch a largemouth bass you measure it but you harvest it and in the process you you open up the stomach and you take a picture of the stomach contents or you do a video through the app there's that's a way that you could actually collect data from anglers already out there that could feed into uh information about uh uh, about predators on salmonids. So there's there there's another example of of where that might fit in. And I believe, I mean, I don't know the the hydro uh, power uh, sector that well, but I believe those are things that uh, are already uh, being done by folks in the in the uh, sector. I uh, I can tell you, you know, at least on a on a personal level, you know, speaking beyond uh, just my my role here at uh, Northwest River Partners is that uh as as an angler i uh i've 
not run into too many of the northern pike minnow on the Columbia River, but uh, I do enjoy going out there and catching a lot of smallmouth bass. And uh, and those guys, you know, well, well, selfishly, I really enjoy having access to uh, to such a robust population of them. Um, I can only imagine the the damage they probably do on juvenile salmon, especially considering that probably like the best lure that I've found is the uh, the rainbow trout pattern Rapala, right? <laughs> right. I mean, they just go nuts for that thing. So. That uh, that probably tells you, and you know, in the bass world, I know it's kind of taboo to to harvest them, but um, it's probably not all bad to to encourage people to do a little bit more of that, not only for the the health of the bass population, but also for the health of the salmon uh, the salmon population as well. Yeah, I know it can be very tense between the bass anglers and the salmon anglers. Don't get between them. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll stay out of that water here for sure. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, we're kind of we're kind of winding down here. And uh, the, the last thing I really want to ask you, you know, um, is just as far as kind of, you know, maybe your your final word to our audience. I mean, is there uh, is there anything you'd encourage folks to go out and do? I mean, I, I know for myself personally, I'm, I'm definitely going to download that app and, and see what I can uh, what I can get involved in, you know, just for my own recreational angling on the weekends and things but uh for for the rest of our listeners is there some key takeaways you'd like them to have yeah and and it's more in, in line with uh if if there's a specific research question that that you're interested in your fishery or, or there's a challenge is if there's a fit for my catch uh, please get get hold of me I'd, I'd love to chat some more what we're trying to do is is find ways this is a, still a brand new uh technology it's it's still still at the the early stages, but I believe this area of citizen science where anglers play a meaningful role in the conservation of, of the fishery has a, has a, has a lot uh, to offer fishery science in general. And the more we can connect the anglers who are on the water, uh, understanding the resource with the fishery scientists in, in a way where there's collaboration, I, I think that can only benefit, benefit us all. Absolutely. And, and I think, uh, you know, something that's very worth pointing out too is that uh, it it not only changes the the understanding of the the fish themselves and of the the resource, but it also really I think is is positive for the the culture around fishing and the the mindset of anglers of being more conservation focused as opposed to um, you know trying to catch the most fish or the biggest fish or you know fill your cooler so to speak right. Yeah, yeah, very much fills out fills out the uh, the the full experience of angling connected with the science as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, there is a there is kind of one bonus question that we always tack on here at the end of every podcast, and that's to take a step back from the the conversation that we've had today, as far as uh, you know, some of the more specific stuff, and uh, get back to kind of you know who our guest is themselves, and give you the give you the floor at the end and. It's always kind of a, a little bit of an on the spot thing as well. So, uh, you know, some people appreciate it. Some people don't. But uh, <laughs> hopefully you find yourself in the, the appreciating camp. But uh, we always ask everyone to kind of close us out with just a little bit of maybe some general uh, life advice, you know, something that maybe you live by or something you recently have, you know, discovered has really helped you in not only your career, but also just, you know, day to day and how you're kind of uh, approaching the world. So, uh, if you don't mind giving us a little bit of advice, we'd certainly appreciate it. Oh, well, that is an interesting question. I I would start by saying it's always a good idea to appreciate how little you know, and go in and 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 be open to ideas and and being able to then test the ideas. It's not not only not only do you do you want to listen to new ideas then you want to test those ideas and test those assumptions do those ideas hold hold true and i find the the older i get and i'm not that old i'm mid 50s but uh the older i get the less i know and uh it's more important to sort of keep keep uh your mind open to new ideas but at the same time be rigorous in testing those assumptions just to make sure you're you're tacking with as close as possible to the truth I don't know if that's helpful or not, Austin, but that's my advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I I certainly think that it's helpful. Um, I I totally understand exactly what you're saying, and uh, 
as you know, someone who's not getting any younger myself, I'm <laughs> definitely find that uh, that that rings true. And uh, I, I also think too that it uh, definitely fits within the the spirit of today's discussion as well. And um, you know, whether it's the the science or, or anything else, it's it's a definitely important thing to to keep that open mind and and always be able to adapt and uh, maybe you know look at things from a different perspective. So uh, really appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today, Austin. Professionally speaking, I'm very enthusiastic about what Sean is doing with the Salmon Prize and what it could ignite for learning more about salmon and what we can do to help them thrive. As an angler on the weekends, I've downloaded the MyCatch app and am excited to dive into it as I have a feeling it could add another layer of enjoyment to fishing. Unfortunately, with this episode being recorded in the dead of winter though, I've got a few months to go before some of my favorite species to target are biting once again. I'd also like to know why nobody ever informed me about limnology back in my college days because, man, what a cool deal that would have been to study, right? Ah well. Communications didn't turn out too bad, so I guess I can't complain. Now, if you're like me, and it's going to be a little bit longer before you can jump back into your favorite activities, I've got just the thing for you to fill up your time with while you hunker down and ride out the cold. First, you can contact us either via the contact form on our site, nwriverpartners.org, or by emailing us directly at info at nwriverpartners.org. And You can let us know what you think of the podcast, who or what you'd like to hear next, or just strike up a friendly hydro conversation. Next, you can follow us at NW River Partners on Facebook, Instagram, X, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Last but definitely not least, please kindly leave us a five-star review on your favorite listening platform, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss future episodes which are back to their bi-weekly schedule in 2024. Speaking of 2024, I hope you all had a great start to the new year, and I look forward to bringing you more awesome episodes of Damn. Thanks, and see ya.